Welcome back. So, yesterday we were looking at the Ethan Allen interior decorating book, and today we're going to look at the Ladies Home Journal book. And again, we have a really interesting pattern on the front. In a lot of ways here, this is the backside of the Ethan Allen book. As you can see, it's very similar. Uh, shades of green, a long sort of scrolling vine kind of pattern. Frankly, I find the Ethan Allen book a little more interesting artistically, but still, I'm guessing that this must have been a popular motif for book covers back in the day. Well, when we come back, we are going to take a look at what's in between these book covers. Well, our Ladies Home Journal decorating book starts off with a bit of an historical recap, just as the Ethan Allen book did. And notice, this is Ladies Home Journal, Ethan Allen, same picture. Let's see if we can get up so you can see that. There we go. So, I'm guessing they were fond of using the same sources. What it does tell you is that this is perceived as a classic example of Massachusetts country farmhouse kitchen or keeping room back in the colonial period. Good to know. Let's see what else we can find in here. All right, once again, we have the uh, late colonial Revolutionary War era. So this will be late 18th century interiors. And frankly, these are a little better than the ones from the Ethan Allen book. One of the things that you notice from all of them, let me show you with this one. They all have the same general layout, a table in the middle of the room. This would have been a work table and the furniture lined up along the perimeters of the room. See, same thing here, table, furniture on the perimeter. And this goes back very far. This goes back to the Middle Ages when there would have been a table in the middle of virtually any room in a, a peasant's hut. That would have been the table for preparing food and for eating. And, you know, in, even in the castle, that table would have been the room where the ladies would have done their embroidery, and the seating would have lined the perimeters of the room. And that was something that just transitioned through time, right into the Victorian era. It really didn't pass away until the 20th century. Now, now we have some fabulous pictures here. That is a linen press. And this is a court cupboard. And at this point, we are talking about the earliest furniture you would have seen in, uh, in America, frankly. These are 17th century pieces. Beautiful. Again, chests. And now we are moving into the high boys. These are early high boys. This would have been uh, early 18th century. That's the very early 1700s. Beautiful, beautiful pieces, and I'm glad they included them. And next we go off to chairs, and we're talking um, very late 17th, early 18th century. Chairs like these were common in Massachusetts. Of course, here's our Windsor. Uh, Windsor chairs were just ubiquitous during the period they were well-made, beautiful, delicate, elegant, comfortable, and very, very sturdy. Then we go over to the chairs that, here, this little piece right in here is called a splat. 
I know, wonderful term. And if you'll notice, you see this, and this is the beginnings, in this chair here, which is 17th century. We move into the 18th century, it becomes decorative. This is a ladder back chair, but here, in the Chippendale period, it becomes very decorative. And as you look at the history, you can see the evolution of these chairs. I do love this. It's a great little sort of quickie trip through the past. And now we're looking at tables. This is usually called a butterfly table because of the way this little triangular piece flips out to support the leaves, rather looks like butterfly wings. This is a trestle table, one of the oldest kinds of tables out there. Gate legs. Pay special attention to the gate leg table, and here's why. On the East Coast, you can still find 17th century gate leg tables in thrift stores, antique shops, junk shops. They are out there. In general, they are very inexpensive, but you really can, for a few bucks, walk away with a piece of furniture 250, 300 years old. So, gate leg table. You want to start collecting really old pieces? Personal advice, this is where you start. Um, this is a tea table. A table like this would have been pulled out from the perimeter of the room. As I said earlier, the furniture was lined up along the perimeter of the room. They would have pulled that out into the center of the room and served tea on it. This, this is called a pie crust table. It's also a tilt top table. So I guess technically it would be a tilt top pie crust table. The top flipped over back and forth. As you can see, the top is in the, uh, the unused position. This is how it was stored. So you could take this table and again, put it up against the wall. Remember, they love doing that. And when it was in use, you pull it out and flip the top. Uh, tables like these were used for everything, but mostly food service. You might have breakfast on a table like this. Um, you might have tea on a table like this. I have actually seen, uh, and I think the piece is in the Winter Term Museum, I'm not sure, a beautiful, very elaborate pie crust tilt top table that actually had plate carvings right around the table to show you where you would put everybody's dinner plate. So their primary purpose was food service, but because it was going to spend most of its time up against the wall, remember, everything was up against the wall, they went out of their way to make sure it was very decorative. This, of course, is a card table or game table. This top would have flipped over on top of this bottom piece. It would have had felt, you know, to facilitate throwing dice or dropping cards. But the underside of this, the side that is to the back, facing the wall, would have had the same beautiful finish. And this is a black and white photo. I can't tell you what, uh, what the wood is. I would bet on mahogany. So these were very beautiful tables. And again, when it wasn't in use, you flip that top down, shove it up against the wall. Larger pieces. This is a wonderful early secretary. This is a Goddard piece. Uh, and we took a look at Goddard pieces from the Ethan Allen book. In fact, I know this is a desk, and I don't believe the other piece we saw was a desk. We saw a similar uh, Goddard case piece. Again, the high end of Chippendale, Newport Chippendale, Philadelphia Chippendale, the very high end. More Chippendale pieces. Um, we have uh, a bow front or Bombay. 
uh, secretary here, another secretary, very Chippendale. This is a simple Chippendale sofa. With a sofa like this, the lines are important. That's what. That's all that really matters. That was Chippendale's version of what a sofa looked like. And now we go back to chairs. And we've got Sheraton's um, Heppel White. You all know my theory about Heppel White. I'm sure that it was actually Anne who did the design, not her husband. And remember that splat. And notice how very, very decorative it's becoming in the Sheraton period. Uh, furniture was becoming lighter. It was becoming more delicate. Um, this is something they're calling a fancy chair. These pieces were very interesting because they were often painted. And when they were painted, it was often done by the lady of the house. They would just decorate their little bits and pieces. And take a look here are this obviously is a very delicate and interesting piece it's described as blue and white so we have to assume this is another painted piece again who knows by whom very likely the lady of the house and of course another very nice heppel white piece we have more case pieces here, and I'm just going to give you sort of an overview because we'll go into this in more detail when we take a look at the antique encyclopedia. Remember that card table with the piece that flipped up? Here we go. Here's another piece, and this one was designed to have that half instead of flipping over onto the top, remain upright so you could see the beautiful wood grains. Again, sofas, some really, really nice chairs. And a lot of this furniture is the sort you'll see in the White House because it was very popular American furniture. And Jackie Kennedy was careful to include this in her restoration. So let's take a look at this. What we have here is a Victorian room. Now we had talked about Victorian rooms when we took a look at that in the uh, Ethan Allen book. This is what a Victorian room would look like in terms of color. Remember the other one, the coloring was very, very dull. Yes, the Victorians probably would have beaten you in the head with red, plus a nice busy wallpaper. Now, there are a couple of things that you wouldn't have seen in a genuine Victorian room. One of them is you wouldn't have seen this much white. Now, there's a very practical reason for that. These rooms were heated either with wood or coal fires, which means that there would have been a residue of soot and smoke on everything. Even if the uh, trim and paper started off white, it would not be before too long. And the wallpapers, unlike the trim, couldn't be washed. Another thing is they would not have used a solid expanse of color the way they have in the carpet. They would have actually preferred a wild floral design. In fact, there is a, a state picture I'll see if I can find it. President Lincoln. He was receiving guests, and I don't remember who. I'll, I'll look the picture up. But he made sure to show a good amount of the floral carpeting because it was new and it was expensive. So something like this, no. To the Victorians, that would have looked accidental. It would have looked as if somebody just spilled a can of paint on the floor and walked away. They, this was not to their taste. They would have wanted flowers or uh, some other kind of intricate visual um, activity here. This just would have seemed 
dull to them, and it would have seemed to be a massive waste of floor space. Also, even though they did have looms big enough to weave carpets of this size in this era, this just isn't how they did them. They did these intricate floral designs. They did replicas of oriental rugs. So the overall impact of the room, yes, that's Victorian. But when you start looking at some of the details, too much solid color, white that they never could have maintained through a single heating season, and of course, as we've already discussed, there would have been tchotchkes everywhere. The Victorians adored their stuff. And they were the first, the first full generation of average people who could afford stuff. Uh, the, the economic increase in the Victorian era made it possible for average folks to have the most incredible variety of stuff. And they, they appreciated that to the maximum extent possible. And they, they just surrounded themselves with goodies. And, and I can understand that because they had more in terms of personal possessions than their parents or grandparents ever would have dreamed possible. And loads of stuff, especially stuff from all over the world, was the mark of a prosperous household. That's how they would have shown off their success and their wealth to their guests. We've got a couple more Victorian rooms here. Again, we have this red wall-to-wall -wall carpeting. And now, keep in mind, a wall-to-wall -wall carpet in any home at this time had to be custom-made for that home. Um, they, they didn't do it the way they do it now, stapling it to the floor, getting it in, in large rolls. That, that wasn't done. So wall-to-wall -wall carpeting would have been very expensive. And remember what we said about the heating. They had no vacuum cleaners, so maintaining carpeting like this that that would be very difficult to pick up and beat out in the backyard to get rid of the coal dust and you know the smoke and whatever that would have been it would have been more work than most households would be capable of so this no wall-to-wall -wall carpeting was definitely a mid-century thing and that's what we're seeing here a mid-century interpretation of victoriana uh, interesting bedroom, some nice pieces in here, but again, we still have that carpeting. That was not how they rolled. Before we go off to anything else, I want you to see this. This was something uh, that you would have seen anywhere you looked in the early 19th century. Beautiful window designs. They had drapery houses in London, in Paris, in Boston, uh, and New York, of course, Philadelphia, where they would create these incredibly beautiful and elegant window treatments. Um, I just think they're wonderful. And Thomas Jefferson did his own designs for window treatments. Um, and uh, the sketches survive. So we definitely know what Jefferson liked in terms of windows, but this was typical. And they would run these ads in newspapers. They would create their own little broadsheets, send them out in order to get customers. So this is what an elegant window treatment looked like from, say, um, the 1790s through to maybe the 1820s. Very interesting. And let's take a look at this because this is very accurate. If you take a look at this sort of um, mural wallpaper, papers like these were really 
popular in the late uh, 18th, early 19th century. And they were amazing. They were beautiful. They, they sometimes told an entire story. There are papers like this in the White House that show the settling of Plymouth Colony and whatever. A paper like this, which appears to have animals, might have been intended to depict a farm scene, could have just as easily been intended to predict the Garden of Eden or Noah's Ark. And notice the rug as well. Again, oriental rugs or contemporary interpretations of the rugs from the Middle East were very popular. And of course, as I'm sure you must notice, all the furniture is hugging the perimeter of the walls again. So that is a bit of an overview of what we're going to see in this particular book. But before we depart from this book, I just wanted to show you that like the Ethan Allen book before it, this one has some favorite color combinations. Red and green. About half of the color photos in this book show rooms that look like they are trying out for Christmas. Uh, Red and green seems to be the popular color combination of the year 1954, along with its sort of more subdued cousin, pink and gray. Another thing this book has that I like is before and after shots. In this case, I actually like the before shot a little more. But um, I, I've mentioned this before, I'm very fond of that very comfy World War II era decorating. And that's more along the lines of what this is, uh, World War II. I'm assuming this interior was put together perhaps 10 years ahead of this one. It's pretty, I can see mid-century modern coming into this. Um, the pink and gray is a very soothing combination, and it was hot in the 50s. In the later 50s, it really turned into pink and black, and let's remember Elvis Presley in his pink and black clothing and his pink Cadillacs, but this was the beginnings of that as a decorating color combination. However, I do like this better. Um, I am just very fond of the World War II era decorating. They tended to do a lot more in terms of, well, mix and match. In other words, not matched furniture, mixed up pieces that didn't look like sets. Pieces here do look like sets. We have chair and sofa. We have chair and chair. It was less matchy-matchy in the 40s and, to my mind, a little more comfortable. All right, that's what I have for you today. Clearly, I have much, much, much more, and we are going to explore these books together. So, don't forget to get over to the Sumi's Angels Facebook page, take a look at the giveaways, sign up, stick around, Talk to the people over there. They are wonderful, very welcoming. And we're going to take a look at a little slideshow, and I will see you all next time.